Good evening, everyone. So wonderful to see so many people in our home. Thank you for being here tonight. I'm Mary Pat Higgins. I'm the President and CEO of the Dallas Holocaust and Human Rights Museum. And it's my pleasure to welcome you to tonight's program, Human Rights Past and Present, 80 Years Since Japanese American Internment. I'd like to start by thanking our wonderful community partners for this event. AJC Dallas, Japan American Society of Dallas Fort Worth, and SMU's John G. Tower Center for Public Policy and International Affairs. It is an honor to work with these important community organizations on an event at the intersection of each of our missions. When we opened this museum back in September of 19, we dreamed of being a convener for the community of other organizations doing like-minded work. And so it makes me very happy to be doing that tonight. The timing of tonight's event couldn't be better as our current special exhibition, Courage and Compassion, the Japanese American World War II Experience chronicles many of the stories you will hear about tonight. I think many of you were in the special exhibition. I hope you had a chance to see it. If you didn't get enough time, you can always come back. Um, I'd like to take some time to thank our incredible sponsors who made it possible to have this exhibition here. Texas Instruments, Carl B. and Florence E. King Foundation, the Texas Holocaust, Genocide, and Anti-Semitism Advisory Commission, and our exhibition sponsors, Orchid Giving Circle and Toyota. Please help me thank our incredible sponsors. We are very grateful for their incredible support. And I'd like to give a special thank you, as I always do, to our museum members. Um, for If you're a member, raise your hand. Awesome. There are a lot of members. I see many people who are not members. So this is an opportunity for you. Um, I, I hope that you'll, if you're not a member, that you'll consider joining our museum family and help us make events like this possible tonight. There'll be a membership desk outside, but our members really are family and help sustain us and help us put on programming like this. So thank you members and so many of our board members for being here tonight. It's wonderful to see you. Before I think turn things over to our partners, I also wanted to remind you that as always, we'll have time for questions at the end of the panel discussion. So we'll pass out note cards. Please use those note cards and we'll collect them and do our best to answer as many of them as possible. And if you're watching virtually, please use the Q&A button at the bottom of your screen and we'll get to some of those questions or as many of those questions as possible too. So now it is my pleasure to welcome Mark Platt, AJC Dallas board member to the podium. Hello, I'm Mark Platt, and I'm a member of the Dallas Regional Board of the American Jewish Committee, or AJC. AJC is honored to participate in this program as it reflects AJC's values of protecting human rights and preventing religious and racial discrimination and hate. FDR famously called the attack on Pearl Harbor a day that will live in infamy. But today we are here to discuss a chapter in American history that equally lives in it. As we think back 80 years to the time of Japanese internment, our instincts tell us that we as Americans are better than that. And yet, as we all know, there have been times in our history when we simply have not lived up to our ideas and we have not been better than that. I'm sure that the case of Fred Korematsu will be discussed tonight as his daughter, Dr. Karen Korematsu, is one of the panelists. In his dissenting opinion in Korematsu versus United States, Justice Jackson reprimanded the majority that upheld Mr. Korematsu's conviction 
for violating an order from the U.S. Army that excluded all persons of Japanese ancestry from San Leandro, California, because it had been designated a military area. Justice Jackson said, if any fundamental assumption underlies our system, it is that guilt is personal and not inheritable. But here is an attempt to make an otherwise innocent act a crime because the prisoner is the son of parents as to whom he had no choice and belongs to a race from which there is no way to resign. Unfortunately, Justice Jackson's opinion was a dissent. It was not until 2018 that our Supreme Court formally declared that Korematsu was wrongly decided. As Justice, Chief Justice, Justice Roberts held in Trump versus Hawaii that year, Korematsu was gravely wrong the day it was decided, has been overruled in the court of history. And to be clear, and here Justice Jackson's dissent is quoted, has no place in law under, under the Constitution. Obviously, it took way too long for the Supreme Court to make that declaration. But it is programs like tonight's and exhibitions like the one currently running at this museum that will maintain that court of history sentiment that the Korematsu decision and the overall treatment of US citizens of Japanese ancestry during World War II were shameful and wrong. Now, I would like now I'd like to introduce uh, Julia Wada from the Japan American Society of Dallas Fort Worth. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Japan American Society of Dallas Fort Worth is privileged to partner tonight on this important conversation on the legacy of Japanese American internment. Japan American Society of Dallas Fort Worth is dedicated to building connection and friendship between the Japanese people and the people of North Texas. Uh, we have uh, programs on uh, culture and language, on Japanese policy and business, education and outreach and international exchange. You can learn more about us at our website, jsdfw.org, or follow us on social media. Personally, I'm proud to have multiple connections to tonight's conversation. As a board member for uh, the, the museum, as well as Japan America Society, and also as part of the Orchid Giving Circle and a Toyota team member. Um, I'm also a legacy of Japanese American internment myself, as my uh, father and his family were interned in Gila River uh, when he was 13 years old. Uh, he was one of the Nisei generation, so that second generation born here of uh, uh, parents who are immigrants. And he was, uh, he, they didn't talk too much about what they called camp. Uh, but he showed me every day how proud he was to be an American. And uh, I'm just really happy to be here tonight, a place where, uh, a country where we can have these kinds of conversations, make sure that we remember our history and learn from, them, from it, and then be able to move forward and work together toward the ideals we all have. And I'm happy to be able to introduce our moderator tonight. Her name is... Um, Hannah Rudolph, and she's the Assistant Director of American Jewish Committee's Asia Pacific Institute in New York, where she coordinates high-level diplomatic and political outreach in the U.S. and across Asia, and furthers cooperation between international and local partners. Uh, with that, let me ask Maya to come on, uh, or Hannah to come on, uh, and uh, help us get the panel started. Thank you so much. Um, I'd like to thank the organizers of today's program for allowing me and inviting me to moderate this conversation as Assistant Director of AJC's Asia Pacific Institute and as a Japanese American myself. It is really a privilege to just be on the stage with these incredible speakers. Um, let me start by introducing our three speakers and for the sake of time, I will slightly abbreviate their very incredible bios. Immediately to my left is Dr. Rick Halperin. He is the director of the Human Rights Program at Southern Methodist University. 
He has held many leadership positions in human rights and social justice organizations. During more than 50 years with Amnesty International USA, he has served as chair of his board of directors three times. He has also served on the boards of the National Coalition to Abolish the Death Penalty, the Center for Survivors of Torture, the International Rescue Committee, and the Texas Coalition to Abolish the Death Penalty. He has participated in human rights, UN human rights delegations that inspected the Irish prison conditions in Dublin and Belfast, as well as in delegations monitoring human rights in El Salvador and Palestinian refugee camps in Gaza. To his left is Dr. Karen Koramatsu, who is the founder and executive director of Fred T. Koramatsu Institute and the daughter of the late civil rights icon, Fred Koramatsu, who I know we will be discussing this evening. Since her father's passing in 2005, Karen has carried on his legacy, establishing the Institute in 2009 to advance racial equity, social justice, and human rights for all. In 2015, Karen was inducted as the first non-lawyer member of the National Asian Pacific American Bar Association. She serves on the board of directors of Advancing Justice AAJC and NAPABA Law Foundation. Her op-eds have appeared in the New York Times and Washington Post, and her numerous awards and honors include the Muslim Advocates Voice of Freedom Award, the ACLU Chief Justice Earl Warren Civil Liberties Award, and the Asian Pacific American Institute for Congressional Studies Community Leadership Award. And last but not least, we have David Ono, who is a Japanese American filmmaker and the anchor for ABC7 Eyewitness News at 4 p.m. and 6 p.m., the top rated newscasts in all of Los Angeles. He also anchors Eyewitness News on KDOC at 7 p.m. David, um, beyond all of his extensive um, reporting, uh, has traveled across Europe and Asia chronicling brave acts of Nisei soldiers from World War II. He has produced multiple award winning documentaries including The Legacy of Heart Mountain, about a Japanese-American intern internee relocation center, and two of his documentaries have made their way to the Smithsonian Institution. David has won nine Edward R. Murrow Awards, 28 Emmys, two RTDNA National Unity Awards, six AAJA National Journalism Awards, and was honored with the Nas Distinguished Journalist Award by the Society of Professional Journalists. So as you can see, we have a really remarkable uh, panel this evening. Before I jump into questions, I want to remind you all once again that there were note cards on your seat when we sat down. As you have questions, please jot them down. And um, towards the end of this initial program, we will collect the cards and we will be glad to ask those questions. Rick, let's start by discussing the historical circumstances that led to Executive Order 9066. Could you speak a little bit to what was happening in the US around this time 80 years ago um, that led to this order? Sure. Excuse me. Thanks. Um, welcome, everybody. Uh, I'm afraid it's the educator in me that has a show and tell. I, I just can't get away from it. So uh, I'll be brief, but I hope this will give you a pretty good background uh, that the order when it came from FDR was really the culmination of 90 years or more of a broader contextual anti Asian. Uh, policy and actions in the United States, and that is what I want to highlight or lowlight for you, as, as the case may be. And believe me, I'm only mentioning some of these, but they're all significant in the development of what has happened in this country. So this will be chronological up to uh, the attack at Pearl Harbor, and then I'll have some images to show, and that will be the end of my initial question. Uh, <clears throat> this really began uh, Asian immigration into the United States right after the gold rush to California in 1848. So California experienced uh, minor, I mean only a few thousand Chinese folks coming to search for gold uh, in early 1850. But by 1853, over 30,000 people had come in the preceding year. So California began to, and California had just become a state in 1850 to immediately pass laws as they deemed this to be a potential problem on their hands. <clears throat> Excuse me. Um, in 1862, most of the United States was involved in a war between the North and the South. But the California legislature passed a, a bill which is considered to be the beginning of direct segregation against the Chinese. 
And the name of the bill uh, is significant. It was called the Anti Cooley Act, um, which levied a tax on people coming. So we have an initially from day one, laws by the very name of the laws is using uh, demeaning uh, uh, language to uh, be, a, be inflicted on these folks from China. <clears throat> In 1870, clearly the war, uh, civil war had ended five years earlier, the, what, there was a United States Naturalization Act and it let African Americans, especially those who had been enslaved, become citizens uh, through naturaliz naturalization, but all Asians, all Asians, regardless of where they were from, were considered to be uh, permanent aliens and were banned from voting and serving on juries. They had no access, no legal access to the American uh, legal system. In 1880, many of you have heard of this notorious federal piece of legislation, the Chinese Exclusion Act. The name is pretty self-explanatory. It was only supposed to be a 10-year piece of legislation, and it kept being renewed for 61 years until 1943, uh, when it was repealed because the United States needed air bases in China to bomb the Japanese mainland. We were too far removed in the Pacific Island campaign. That's the only reason it was repealed, not for any high moral uh, reason. The Chinese Exclusion Act is the first law in American history to prevent all members of a specific ethnic or national group from even coming into this country. The 1880s was an era in the Mountain West, in places such as Wyoming, Idaho, and in the Far West uh, of major race riots against Chinese individuals, overwhelmingly uh, against minors in the Mountain West, but it was an era that doesn't get a lot of history per se in American history, but it was an era of extreme violence against uh, Chinese individuals, mostly from the 1880s to the early uh, 1890s. In, excuse me, in uh, 1898, the United States went to war and won a war militarily, the Spanish-American War, and the United States, as part of its acquisitions after that war, uh, made some inroads into the Pacific. We occupied the Philippines from 1898 until 1916, and in that generation in America, the Philippines and Filipinos were called our little brown brothers. And I told you it's a show and tell. There is a book that refers to our little brown brothers because that's what Filipinos and the islands in general were referred to. 1905, the year before the major earthquake in San Francisco, the first Japanese and Korean Exclusion League was formed in San Francisco. The earthquake happened in 1906. And in 1907, the Japanese and Korean Exclusion League was renamed the Asiatic Exclusion League. It was broadened to more than just folks from Japan. And these Japanese and Korean or Asiatic Exclusion Leagues are seen historically as the start of the anti-Japanese movement in the United States. So right at the turn of the century, 19. 07. And just as Chinese individuals had been the targets and victims of race riots in the 1880s, this happened on the West Coast against Japanese uh, citizens. And it happened in Canada as well. So it happened in Vancouver. It happened in Tacoma. It happened in California, uh, in Bellingham, right outside of Seattle. Um, these anti-Japanese riots. So this violence against Asians was nothing new. Uh, the era from 1926 to 1930, it became the turn of Filipinos in the United States. That was their era of being targeted, targeted 
violence and race riots um, in the United States. Right on the eve of World War II in 1934, Congress passed an act halted all Filipino immigration uh, into the United States. So when the attack came uh, at Pearl Harbor, the culmination FDR's order, this was consistent, I'm sad to say, this was consistent policy against, an, against a group of individuals, in this case, Japanese, Japanese Americans who had been demeaned, disgraced uh, by attacks 25, 30 years earlier, and of course, other Asians before them. So before I get to um, the images, which, I'm, which I will roll through, and they're very short, um, I just want to point out a major and recent award-winning book, if this broad topic is of interest to you, it's called America for Americans, a history of xenophobia in the United States. I'm sad to say that this is still relevant today. Uh, it is disturbing reading, and in my biased opinion, it ought to be required reading for anyone, whether they're in school or an adult. Uh, it's, a, it's a scathing indictment, not only of who we once were, but sadly, in part, who we still remain. So if I may, uh, these images uh, deal with the beginning of the attack at Pearl Harbor, uh, and I will just roll through them. Some are images and some have words on them, but I'll be brief. And here I'll just really, you can read this for yourself. These next images are official or were official U.S. governmental posters about how Japanese and Japanese soldiers, Japanese politicians, were being dehumanized and depicted to the American population uh, as the war began. These are official government posters. To again, disgrace, demean, dehumanize, and prepare this nation for the war that was at hand. And this is correct language. They were, of course, deemed as subhumans which made it easier to do what the American government and individuals were to do. These photos do not represent, as was said just a moment ago, do not represent the best nature of who we like to think we once were or still are. These photos are sometimes hard to come to grips with. The location of the camps, which will be talked about in just a few moments. These images speak for themselves. So I'll just conclude by saying again, it wasn't uncommon, it wasn't an aberration. Americans had listened for 30 years to this phrase. It started with the Chinese must go. This was all over the US, especially the West in the 1880s and 90s, and then it became 
the Filipinos, the Japanese, and Asians must go. This is what this country was dealing with in the first or in the century from the 1850s until we went to war. Thanks very much. Thank you so much, Rick. If any of you are interested in the resources that Rick mentioned, we will be sending out an email following the program with further resources, and I'm sure many of these books will be included. Karen, let me turn to you. Since your father resisted going into the camps, can you share about his experience? Um, and, and was this type of resistance common? Well, good, good evening. Is this on? Test, test. Can you hear me? Uh, can, you, can you borrow Rick's first? No, can borrow Rick's. <laughs> okay, we know that one. We know that works. Does that work? No? I have to use my cheerleading voice? Okay. Does, does that work now? Okay. Good evening, everyone. Uh, it's it's a pleasure to uh, to be with you uh, this evening, and uh, and and thank you to the uh, um, to uh, to all of you who have come to be educated um, and learn more about the Japanese American incarceration and how it relates to our issues today. Um, we I just wanted to make a few comments before in, in the beginning because we we were able to have a, a, a short tour. <laughs> Uh, before the, the program of this phenomenal museum. Uh, and I hope you all have been able to, to, to see it. But you know the parallels of seeing the poster propaganda uh, during World War II is, is kind of no different than what the, pro the, the poster propaganda that we saw in the museum. The, 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 the parallels of how um, our different ethnicities have been marginalized um, through, through history. Uh, is is one that we need to now say that uh, no more, and uh, and that we need to understand our history. Our history is present, uh, and we need to realize that we keep making the same mistakes, and that we uh, need to continue to learn from each other, to work together, uh, to, uh, to to share stories because that's how um, we all learn, especially students. Uh, I'm in education and, and believe you me, they, they will remember stories more so than reciting facts. Um, and, uh, and then uh, the, the, you saw one of these, the slides uh, that Rick showed uh, and it was the Mochita family, which is um, actually my, my grandfather's cousin. Uh, it's, it's, a, it's a really a, a well-known, Photograph of a, a family of uh, wearing all their tags, but the the usually you see the the bag at the bottom of the uh, of the picture. It says Mochita uh, because he he felt it was important to have his name on on his you know the luggage they could carry him with both hands, and that was it. Uh, and so you know, these all these different experiences are part of this of this story. Uh, my my father was born in Oakland, California. So he was the, the third son of four boys. In other words, he was always the odd man out. Uh, and, uh, and I think that's, that helped, to, helped him to make the decisions that, that he did. But uh, he learned about the Constitution in high school. And he thought he had rights as an American citizen. So when Executive Order 9066 was issued, he thought, well, he's an American, why should he be sent to a prison camp uh, without any charges, uh, without a hearing, without a day in court when he had done nothing wrong? Uh, and he was, he was an American and all due process of law was denied. Uh, back then it was called military necessity. Now we call it national security. And he, uh, he just wanted to, to live his life as, as any American. And, uh, and, but he was arrested about 30 days after his family was sent to a detention uh, assembly prison center in the Bay Area. Uh, it was a horse stall called Tan Ferran. Uh, for you horse fans, if you know uh, Seabiscuit, it was the home of Seabiscuit. Uh, so in other words, the Japanese Americans had to live 
in horse stalls that, that were only whitewashed. They had uh, straw on the on the floor, gaps in the in the in the walls, uh, a light bulb overhead, uh, and it still smelled like manure. And you were given an army cot and an army blanket, and that's how you had to live for three or four months before you were sent away to one of the permanent ten Japanese American incarceration camps across this country, as far as Arkansas. And you in Texas even have Department of Justice camps. Crystal City is one of them, but there are others, some smaller, even uh, uh, U.S. Army camps that were here as, as well. So almost every state was it was in, was impacted. Uh, and when my my father um, was arrested, uh, he was sent finally to a, a federal uh, prison in San Francisco. And a man uh, named Ernest Bessick, who was the executive director of the Northern California affiliate of the American Civil Liberties Union, read about my father's um, arrest and visited my dad in jail and asked my dad if he'd be willing to be a test case. And Mr. Bessick said, if need be, we'll take it all the way to the Supreme Court. And my father thought for sure by the time that it reached the Supreme Court, uh, that they would see that it was that the executive order 9066 was unconstitutional. Uh, you know, of course, through appeals, it took several years. But when he arrived after his bail hearing, he first went to the San Francisco Presidio. There was a, a quote that Rick uh, showed from General John DeWitt, who was based in the San Francisco Presidio, home of the Fourth Army, who was responsible for issuing over 100 uh, exclusion orders after. He convinced uh, one of, or courage, I should say, uh, President Roosevelt to issue uh, Executive Order 9066. Uh, full circle, I have my office there now. Uh, it's a National Park Service site. So, and we are hoping to, to build a, a social justice center to continue on with education. But then he, he was sent finally over to Tam Ferran. And, uh, and when people learned, you know, the community learned that he was there, they had a meeting to decide whether or not my father should even carry on with this case. Uh, and it didn't include my father. Uh, afterwards, uh, my father's oldest brother uh, told my dad that uh, they, you know, the meeting, uh, the members uh, decided uh, that my father should not continue on. But my father believed that this, uh, this, this executive order was wrong. He was ostracized and vilified by his own Japanese American community from day one. He never had any support. And uh, over the years, you know, carried on with his life. Uh, and, uh, and, and my parents uh, met married in, in Detroit, Michigan, which was very friendly Midwest uh, at that time. And I learned about my father's case in high school. Uh, I, I, the high school I attended was 2,500, maybe only six Asian Americans. And my friend, uh, Maya, got up in front of the class after reading a, a book and gave an oral book report. That's what we did back in those days. And, uh, and her book was called Concentration Camps USA. Think about that. Concentration Camps USA. And then she's talking about this terrible time in, in history uh, and, and, and talking about the experiences. And then she said, but there's this one man who resisted the, uh, the military orders and it ended up to be a landmark Supreme Court case called Korematsu versus the United States. Oh, that's my name. And I have 35, pair, 35 pairs of eyes turning around looking at me and I'm shrugging my shoulders like, it must be some black sheep of the family because she never said Fred. So after class, um, I said to my friend, Maya, who's this about? She said, this is about your dad. I said, no way. I said, somebody would have told me. So of course I go running home, confront my mother. And she goes, mm, yes, this is about your father. And uh, you know, get the, 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 the standard answer, you have to wait until he comes home and asks him. <laughs> and not only did my father have you know, um, housing discrimination, he had employment discrimination and sometimes worked two jobs. So he didn't arrive until eight o'clock that night and I had calmed down uh, a little bit. Uh, and I told him what happened. And Maya and I had been friends since we were five years old. So he knew, he knew, my, he knew Maya and, his, and her family 
uh, Japanese Americans also in the in the flower business. Uh, and and he just simply said, it happened a long time ago. And what I did, I I I thought was right, and the government was wrong. That clear and simple. It wasn't complicated. And it was like somebody gave me a, 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 a soccer punch in my stomach and I couldn't ask him any more questions about the experience. But I did ask him if he could vote because voting was very important to my parents. So my message <laughs> nowadays is vote and, and, and also to you know, register and help those to vote because it all counts. Uh, but we didn't talk about it again until my father's case was reopened in 1983. I look forward to asking you a couple more questions about that shortly. I'm going to turn um, to David. Before I do so, I wanted to sort of share that, you know, incredibly, a, a major aspect of the story of Japanese American um, internment is that over 30,000 Japanese American men and women served in the U.S. Army's forces, even as many of their families were incarcerated. The 442nd Regimental combat team remains today one of the most decorated units in military history for its size and length of service, um, earning 21 medals of honor, over 9,000 Purple Hearts, eight presidential unit citations, and more, totaling more than 18,000 awards for their actions during World War II. Um, and it's really meaningful, I think, to note as we sit here in the Holocaust, the Holocaust Museum that a detachment of the 442nd helped to liberate Dachau. Um, the longest running Nazi concentration camp. And this audience here in Texas might especially appreciate that the 442nd was also involved in rescuing the Texas Battalion, also known as the Lost Battalion, in an incredibly heroic rescue attempt. So David, let me turn to you if you could share more about that story, as well as about the 442nd more broadly. Um, how was it formed and how were Japanese Americans in the service treated? Yeah, this is one of the, the, the better stories or the greater stories, I think, of this, this entire World War II chapter. And that is this dynamic group of fighting men um, that came out of the camps and came out of Hawaii. Uh, and, and I think the first thing you have to think about when you think about that era is would you fight for the country that is incarcerating your innocent family? And yet these guys did. And they fought so gallantly and so bravely. The exhibit that is here, the, the, the temporary exhibit is fantastic uh, uh, from the travel exhibit from Gopher Road, which is basically about these brave heroes. But the way it all started out was in the early part of the war, Japanese Americans, Americans were, were as angry about the attack of Pearl Harbor as any other Americans they wanted to fight for the country. The people in Hawaii watched the attack and said, we want to go to war. But the American government didn't trust them. And it wasn't until through attrition in the early part of the war, where our guys were in really tough fights in the Pacific and in Europe and in North Africa that we were losing lots of men. We needed as many men as we could find. So finally, at first, the United States government allowed in the segregated unit, the 100th uh, Infantry Battalion, that came out of the, the militia from Hawaii. They were already organized, they could already fight. So they threw them into the fight and they were fantastic. They went in through Italy and they fought courageously. And the United States government started to realize that these are great soldiers. But through attrition, they lost so many guys, they started uh, allowing some of the men out of the internment camps to join their ranks, as well as the younger Hawaiians to join the ranks. And that's what they call the 442nd. So when you hear the 100th, 442nd, so the Hawaiians first, and then a group of folks from the camps and Hawaiians came in and, and, and helped their numbers out. But by the end of the war, they were astounding. They had such incredible accomplishments. You mentioned the rescue of the Lost Battalion, and that was. Uh, a group of Texans, they call them Texans, but they're really from all over the country, but the unit was headquartered in Texas. In fact, the last time I talked here, there was families that came that were uh, in, that were descendants of, of the Lost Battalion. And that is one of, the U.S. Army considers it one of the top five battles in 
uh, American military history. And the reason is because they went against such insurmountable odds. So this unit of 220 guys found themselves surrounded in the forest of France, a dense forest surrounded by 6,000 fresh German troops. Patton sent in two different units to try to, to break them out, and they couldn't. They finally got down to thinking that this is a hopeless situation. We're not going to be able to get these guys out. And then finally, General Dahlquist said, I'm sending them to the 442nd. They just liberated Briers a few miles away. And even though Dahlquist had promised them a couple of weeks of rest because they were exhausted from fighting, he says, I'm pulling your rest, and you're going to go in there and you're going to get them out at all costs. It's a very controversial decision because a lot of the guys who were in the unit thought that they were what they called cabin fodder, that they didn't really matter because they were Asian in a segregated unit. And it didn't matter if they died as long as they got in, got out the combination of soldiers. Nevertheless, that's the underlying controversy to it. However, once they went into that forest, they fought and they fought hard. And then, as we all know, they got them out. But the attrition was unbelievable. Like I company went in with 187 men and they walked out of the forest, I think with eight guys. K company, uh, something similar, 188 men walked out with 11 guys. And these are the that's the sacrifice that these guys have made and a lot of them still are buried there in france and they did it while their parents were or their families but brothers and sisters were incarcerated and so a, another example of them and i won't take up too much of your time because they're going on they had so many battles but an, another notable battle that shows the prowess as soldiers was the gothic line so the gothic line kind of was this mountain range that went across italy it basically started on the Tuscan coast, coast and went straight uh, west seas. And it was a German stronghold that we could not break through. And so we were there for the better part of nine months fighting the Germans who couldn't break it. The 442 was brought in and they launched an overnight attack and broke it in 30 minutes. So from then on, uh, and in Munamori, you see his exhibit there uh, here at the museum. Um, Sadal and Mori uh, received the Medal of Honor for his gallantry in that fight. So if you see that part of the exhibit, he was killed in that fight, but he, he saved some of his comrades by throwing himself onto a grenade. And what's really tragic, and it's also pointed out in that exhibit, you see the picture of his mother, and, and, and that's notable because it, it kind of wraps everything up for you. Uh, Munamori, Sadal Munamori, a young man from Glendale, California, uh, died in the battle. He had his mother's picture in his pocket. She had sent it to him from the camp so he can carry it with him. When he was killed, they found a picture of her. So they sent it back to her, still in the camp, but now with his blood on it. So you see that. And, and that picture now is on exhibit in, in Manson Art, and it kind of it kind of wraps up the whole tragedy of what these you know young men had to deal with. Their 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 families incarcerated. They're dying on the battlefield. They have no rights, you know, and and they had to deal with this this hate towards um, themselves only because of their heritage. They're not, but they were Americans, you know, proud Americans. But America would never see them as Americans because of the way they looked. And so this this story is an incredible story and i think as a final note and something for you guys to think about is um you've seen band of brothers you've seen the pacific you've seen movies about the big red one and the 82nd airborne and 101st airborne you've seen d-day have you ever seen the, the movie about the 442 or the 100th yet they're the greatest fighting unit in american military history and yet hollywood won't do their story it's because the faces are all Asian. To the same. Thank you, David. Um, skipping forward a little bit, Karen, I said that I will pull back to you on this. President Roosevelt issued Executive Order 9066 in 1942, um, and it wasn't until early 1945 that Japanese Americans um, began returning to the West Coast and elsewhere. Your father's Supreme Court case played a major role in bringing an end to internment. Can you share that now? Um, they didn't work it. <laughs> <laughs> um, 
And also, I want everyone to, to know, if you don't know this fact, that there was 120,000 people of Japanese ancestry that were incarcerated during World War II. And two thirds were American citizens. A third were under the age of 18. So babies and the infirm, they all were, were forcibly removed from their homes. Um, and it, it's, it's something to, to, uh, to keep in mind. So as, as I said, you know, my father's um, case uh, because of appeals finally arrived at the Supreme Court um, on, on December 18th, 1944. Actually, at one time, the Supreme Court threw it back to the Court of Appeals because they didn't want to deal with it, you know, of course. Uh, and uh, so on December 18th, uh, 1944, uh, the, um, the Supreme Court uh, decision was, was six to three. So this, they still found my father guilty of disobeying the military orders. However, it wasn't unanimous. There were two other Supreme Court cases that, that dealt with it, with curfew, Yerbash and, and Yasui. But my father's case, as I said, was a direct violation of a, of, of a military order. So it, the, the, the three dissenting opinions to me are the most important and still relevant today. Um, Justice Murphy called it the ugly abyss of racism. And uh, Justice uh, Owen Roberts said it was unconstitutional. And Justice Robert Jackson, who uh, took the cases to the Nuremberg, led, led, led those cases, um, uh, referred to my father's Supreme Court cases. This lies around like a loaded weapon, ready for anyone to pick up and use with plausible cause, I'm paraphrasing here. And actually they did that after 9-11 uh, in 2001, the, um, uh, the um, Attorney General Ashcroft cited my father's case as a possible reason to round up um, Arab Muslim Americans and, 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 and put them in American concentration camps. So, you know, the, and we've come very close to this kind of, of discussion, you know, before. Uh, but, you know, certainly with, with that decision, and also there was another case called Endo, which was a habeas corpus case, because when, when, the, uh, when the government heard that, that uh, the Supreme Court was going to be hearing, especially Endo's case, the day before, that's when they announced that they were going to be closing all the incarceration camps. So therefore, her, her case was called moot because she was challenging being in, in incarceration in, into a camp when, when she had done nothing wrong. And she actually worked for the, the city of, of Sacramento, California. So she even had a, 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 a state job. Um, but my, my father was totally disappointed, uh, but he never gave up hope that someday he would be able to reopen up his, his Supreme Court case, but he didn't know how to do that. In uh, 1982, uh, Professor Peter Irons, who was a legal historian, um, uh, along with Aiko Hershey Yoshinago, who was a researcher for the War Relocation Authority at the time, there was a commission um, sanctioned by President Carter to review the, uh, how the Japanese Americans were treated during World War II. Um, they, they met and, and found kind of a smoking gun, if you will, that proved there was no military necessity for the Japanese Americans to be forcibly removed and incarcerated. At the time of my father's Supreme Court case, uh, they, uh, the Department of Justice had lied in the Supreme Court had altered evidence and destroyed evidence. So who knows what would have, the outcome would have been if they truly had all of the, the evidence they, they were to, to hear. Um, so, you know, it, it's, it's kind of, this is the, the sort of thing with our Supreme Courts that we're always concerned about, right? Ongoing today, what the government does, what, what, they, don't, what they don't, what the Supreme Court doesn't know. But um, so my father's um, conviction was, uh, was overturned or vacated uh, in 1983, which was very historic and did set the precedent for the redress and reparations, or, or I should say the Civil Liberties Act of 1988 that was signed by President Reagan. Uh, and, uh, and, and so, you know, that was just his federal conviction, meaning he, after almost 40 years, he never could get a government job, he, he was discriminated against, uh, had that hanging over his head, that he, you know, he was, he was, uh, you know, guilty of a federal conviction is, 
it has a, has a, a lot of meaning against you. Um, but in but it, but it, the Supreme Court case was not overturned at that time. Um, the Supreme Court can only reverse itself. So I'll fast forward to uh, 2018 with Trump versus Hawaii. I uh, issued an amicus brief along with actually uh, Gordon Hirabayashi's um, son, Jay, and um, uh, Menyasui's daughter, uh, Holly, to, to remind the court of the overreaching of power and to remind them of my father's Supreme Court case. So um, in, in, in this decision, um, and I respectfully going to disagree with, um, with you, um, uh, um, Matt, um, Mark Platt, um, board member, uh, that uh, even though uh, Chief Justice Roberts um, said it was overturned, it was overturned in the court of history. It was not overturned uh, in concerning upholding the Trump versus Hawaii decision. So it's, and I even made that mistake because I wrote an op-ed in the New York Times the next day because I was told, oh yeah, it was over, you know, it was over, overruled. Um, no, I get the constitutional call, scholars started calling me going, yeah, Karen, no. Uh, so it, it still is a precedent. It still can be used. It has to be, you know, used in, in, a, in a case. But this is, this is what keeps hanging over our heads in this country, that we can still, uh, make these these mistakes and these in these violations of, of law, uh, and uh, you know my my father just always believed. I mean, he always wanted his Supreme Court case to be overturned, but he wa we wanted it to to be you know to be done in the right way, um, and and with a supporting uh, opinion. So it's um, if you ever if you any of you are interested in in reading dissenting opinions, read Justice Sotomayor's opinion, because my opinion is she went she went for the juggler on this one, and uh, and I think that's that's why Justice Roberts made the comment that he did. But it's a well written decision uh, that says that the the government was is is wrong, and you know when we talk about a um, uh, violation of, of human rights, but also a violation against targeting people of a certain religion, whether you're, you're Jewish or you're Muslim or you're Catholic or whatever, you know, it's, it's not right. It's not what this country represents because at the end of the day, we're all Americans. Um. What Karen is saying is incredibly moving, um, but just so that we can go through more questions. David, before we jump back to today, Karen mentioned the Civil Liberties Act of 1988. I was wondering if you could share with us a little bit about what life looked like for Japanese Americans immediately after the internment period ended, and then what the process was to get to the Civil Liberties Act. Sure, sure. Oh, I'm sorry, David. Sure. That's a great question because I think a lot of people make the assumption, and we don't talk enough about what was post-war for Japanese Americans, and, and a lot of them will tell you that was the most difficult part of life because they got out of camp and they didn't, most of them didn't have a home to go to. The U.S. government gave them 25 bucks and a, and a train ticket to get you back to where you came from. But once you got back to where you came from, usually your home was gone your property is gone. They all had to sell their valuables, you know, pennies on the dollar. If they had a car, they had to get rid of it. If they had equipment for work, they had to get rid of it. Um, any of their possessions, they had to get rid of it. As you all know, it was only what you could carry. So they carried a couple of suitcases in the camp, but that was their only possessions. When they got out of camp, went back home, they had to find a place to live, but they also had to find employment. And most places wouldn't employ them any longer. Think about the end of the war, and so many hundreds of thousands of men died fighting the Japanese. So the vitriol and hate towards Japanese Americans continued well after the war. And still, as we all know, and I think we're pointing out, that the ignorance of many Americans was they could not make a distinction between uh, an American of Japanese descent and a person from Imperial Japan. So these people were vilified. They couldn't uh, work. 
they didn't have a place to live. Uh, the Quito family, Brian Quito is a friend of mine, and they run what's called Fugetsu now. It's, uh, it's a mochi shop. It's one of the oldest businesses in all of LA. They started in 1903, and it's still thriving today. But he told me that when they had to go off to camp, um, they, they had to, they asked somebody to protect their property. They got back from camp, their property was gone, all the machines were gone, and they had to live on the Buddhist temple floor for months while they did odds and end jobs to earn the money to get their equipment back or buy their equipment back and, and get the family operation running again. So it was supreme sacrifice and suicide rate was super high. And we all know uh, Lance Ito, who was the judge for the O.J. Simpson trial. So Lance's mother, Toshi, is adorable, what a sweet lady, and I've interviewed her and learned a lot from her. What's interesting about her, she didn't talk about it for most of her life, and then later, later in life, she started to realize the importance of talking to teach people this chapter. But the reason she's really important is because of her father, Lance Ito's grandfather. He was a very successful insurance salesman before the war. They had a house in Los Feliz, if you know LA, Los Feliz is a very nice community, um, but then they got sent off to camp. Nobody would hire him after camp. He sold his car, his equipment, everything of value. And he still couldn't provide for his family, but he had a life insurance policy, so he committed suicide. And suicide is one of those things that it was a huge uptick because people couldn't deal with the misery, um, they couldn't take the despair that they had to deal with after the camp. And, and this is the stuff that kind of gets lost in all the weeds that we don't talk about enough. And so leading to this moment in 1980s when the US government, and thanks to what uh, Dr. Karen just talked about, of uh, these smoking gun that we found, the US government finally said, these people have been victimized. We need to do something about it. We need to help them. Um, we need to find a way to, to make up for this travesty. So they came up with hearings. They call them redress hearings. And they were held in a lot of the big population centers, Los Angeles, San Francisco, Seattle, Washington, DC. And they allowed the folks who had been locked up and incarcerated during World War II to actually come out and speak. The, the irony of it is this generation of Japanese Americans didn't speak. They never talked. And as, as Karen just mentioned, her father never talked. She had to be in class before she actually found out about her father from somebody else besides her family. And this is indicative of the generation. So when the U.S. government said, let's let them talk, everybody stood by and said, is anybody even going to talk? So if I could set the stage for you in Los Angeles, the room at, at near City Hall is filled with people. But nobody knows if anybody's going to say anything. And finally, one person goes up there and starts to talk about how she lost so much and how she lost her dignity. And then the next person wants to talk and the next person, or the next thing you know, these hearings go for several days. They get hours and hours of testimony. By the end of it, the U.S. government was convinced we need to apologize and we need to pay restitution. And that's what President Reagan signed in 1988, the Civil Liberties Act, which was an official apology from the U.S. government and also a $20,000 check to all survivors of camp. So these are those chapters in our history that um, we don't teach enough of. And if we did, we'd have a better understanding of the mistakes our government makes and a better understanding of what these smaller communities have to deal with when it comes to racism and hate. And that's part of what is, I think, what is the front lines of this country right now. And that is, what we teach, how we teach it, who we teach it to, because there's so much ignorance in our country right now. That's a perfect segue into a question I want to ask you, Rick. How does this experience with an apology and reparations compare to how other minorities have been treated in the United States? You know, in, in human rights, some of the basic fundamental pillars of human rights are the ability to face the past, one's past, where and when necessary, admit pain, admit wrongdoing, and apologize for that wrongdoing. In the history of this country, 
you can count on two hands. The United States in our history has only formally apologized six times for formal wrongdoing. That's it. And those six didn't start until 1983. The very first time this country ever apologized was to the government of France, who had, after the war, sentenced the Nazi war criminal Klaus Barbie, the butcher of Lyon, who had murdered and deported Jews to the camps from southern France. They had sentenced him to death, and he had fled. And they had asked the United States, do you know where Barbie is? And the government lied and said no. And actually, he was on the American payroll in Bolivia. And when he got caught and sent back to France, it was pretty embarrassing for this country. So we issued, for the first time, a formal apology. Then came the formal apology on behalf of the internment of Japanese Americans. And the four that have come after that have been the formal apology in 1993 to the people of Hawaii for the formal overthrow of the Hawaiian monarchy by the United States government. There has been a formal apology to African Americans who were victimized by 40 years of abuse at the Tuskegee experiment from 1932 under FDR to 72 under Nixon, 40 years of that. The last two apologies came from Ms. under the administration of Mr. Obama. There was a formal apology in public to African Americans for slavery, 246 years of slavery. And the last apology uh, was, to my opinion, outrageous in that it wasn't public. It was a few lines in a 657-page appropriation bill, and it was a few lines of recognition slash apology to Native Americans for what had been inflicted by white governmental and sometimes genocidal policies to Native Americans. But that one was not a public apology. So there have been six, but five have only been public. I would say, in addition to all of this within human rights, we're coming up on two years. Maybe some of you saw this, maybe not. This is an article from the Sacramento Bee. Two years, February 20th, 2020, California apologizes for Japanese American internment. That's 2020, and that's by the state of California. And I would just add this. In human rights, and some of you have heard me say this, and my students probably wish I would stop saying The tragedy of human rights is that we don't teach it. It's a subject like anything else. It needs to be taught in our elementary schools, not the graphic portions of this terrible behavior, but children at any age understand bullying, abuse, being targeted. They understand that. It needs to be taught in secondary schools. We have to produce a generation of students that stop saying this dangerous phrase, I didn't know, because this is our government, and it's frequently not good behavior of our government. And the last thing of this apology is this phrase, a loaded phrase and frequently negative, but always associated with human rights, and that is, what does a country do in the phrase of for love of country? This is a loaded phrase. And it's not just the United States. It's any country which commits horrific abuses, targeting groups, individuals to pull out the flag, puff out the chest, and say, for love of country, this has to be done. Uh, from military security in the 1940s to what is being done today around the world and by this country 80 years later. Uh, we need to bear in mind what this phrase sometimes is a cover for, and it's not pretty. I'd like to turn um, in a moment to public Q&A. So if you have any questions, drop them down. Um, I think if you flag a staff member at the museum, they will come around and collect it. But let me just ask one more question of the three of you while we collect questions 
You know, we're here this evening to mark 80 years since Executive Order 966. What um, do each of you believe is the lasting legacy of this order? David, perhaps we can start with you and we can come down the road. Thanks. Well, I, I think there's there's a couple of things uh, with this. Number one, you just said it, it's Executive Order 9066. And, then, and I think I recall at the start of the Trump presidency where he was signing a ton of executive orders, which every president does. Every president has the right to sign an executive order. And we kind of gloss over and we don't really pay attention. But I think, if anything, this is a really loud statement of the power of an executive order. You know, it's not Congress that voted this to happen. It was the signing of one signature on a piece of paper that sent 120,000 people to camp. And as we've come to discover, you know, there's a bunch of nuances and information that kind of led up to that decision. A lot of it is very flawed. But once you get into the mind of the president and say, this needs to happen, all he needs to do is sign a piece of paper and it's done. You ruined 120,000 lives. So that always, when I hear Executive Order 9066, and we're going to be recognizing it, the anniversary of that in a week from now. Um, that's what I think of, is the power of a presidency, and what he could do to a group of people. And in this case, a group of innocent people. Yeah, I'll start with you, Dave. It's interesting that I kept talking about Executive Order 906 for years, and people didn't really know what an executive order meant. Uh, until the previous um, president issued his first executive order on, uh, on January um, uh, 27, 2017, which was called, what we just talked about, the, the Muslim, what well, they first called the Muslim ban. And then there was so much pushback, then they called it uh, the immigration ban. And there was more pushback, and then they called it the travel ban, and included Venezuela. So, uh, you know, this is, this is what happens uh, with with executive orders and, uh, and, and, and and the power behind it. I don't think you know, people really understood or even students understood what an executive order meant um, and the power behind it. Uh, and so, uh, but I wanna add though, that um, uh, this past year, uh, it was the Roosevelt Institute that, uh, that is, is, you know, has created this organization to, address um, some of the uh, decisions of, of FDR's past that perhaps were um, were of question, let's put it that way. And, uh, and also, of course, with Eleanor Roosevelt and her, her, her work in, in human rights. But they posthumously honored my father with the Four Freedoms Award uh, in recognition for what he did and in trying to address in, in writing a, a wrong. So that's you know a different generation of Roosevelt's that um, headed up by the board is headed up by Anne Roosevelt, uh, one of uh, President Roosevelt's granddaughters, and they are addressing these uh, these issues today that we all should be concerned about about discrimination, about racism, even in you know economics, um, in climate, uh, but it's it's about stepping up and 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 trying to make a change to recognize our mistakes in the past um, and talking about it. We, you know, we've always kind of pushed these things under the rug, but now we, it's time to talk about them and, and to, to point out what was, was wrong in the past, but so we can learn from that and carry on with the future. This is how we make change. Uh, and we all need to be part of that change and we all can be part of that change. Um, that's why I said voting is so important because that's a stake in our in our government uh, and who we vote for and the decisions that they make is so important uh, to the future to our country and our families and our community. Um, so it's you know in, in recognizing the 80th um, uh, year of Executive Order 9066, uh, it's it's to to make sure that we carry on in addressing these issues to recognize um, you know, the past mistakes and so we don't um, make the same ones in the future. And to honor, you know, is to honor those all who sacrificed. Um, as, as David said, you know, whether it was the 442nd or the 100th Battalion, our own families, uh, it, these are all personal stories and personal sacrifices. And 
you know, it it's it it it, it, it reminds me of, of how my father thought about this country. He was an American. At the end of the day, he was an American. He just happened to be of Japanese ancestry, but he believed in this country. If I, I um, also, I was supposed to bring, and, and it's a long story, but there's a project that was created by a, a Judge Gogo in Santa Clara County, um, California. And in honor of, of the incarceration, he and his family, he's from Guam, he, 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 his family wasn't incarcerated, but heard the story of, of my father and, and from my father's legal team member, Dale Manami. And he has found uh, flags from 1942 with only 48 stars. And he's gone around the country. He's got five flags um, and has, um, has found survivors of the incarceration camps and has signed the stripes and the stars uh, of these flags. So we'll have a, a link to the, the video, the presentation to the flag, the Korematsu Institute um, that you can see. But it's that kind of, of inspiration of, of, you know, my father made a difference in the face of adversity, and so can you. And that's, and Judge Gogo did that by, by creating this project and, and helping to carry on further with education um, of, of our past so we don't continue to make the same mistakes. She's tough as well. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, for me, FDR's order should have been a wake-up call. It was the culmination, as I said in my opening remarks, of 90 years of legal, and there's the key word, legal actions based on racism, bigotry, prejudice, whatever you wish to call it and wrapped in the law. The law made it possible for 90 years to be culminated in the stroke of a pen called Executive Order 9066. And that should be a warning to all of us. It should have been then. But of course, there was no awareness of human rights. The modern world of human rights didn't tragically start until the horrors of the Holocaust had been un unmasked even to that degree until 1948 and beyond. That's really the only beginning of the world we're in. Barely 75 years of the awakening to the idea that all people are entitled inherently to a fundamental right to a life with dignity and rights. And the word dignity comes before rights. Executive Order 9066 should have been a fire bell in the night. But here we are 80 years later. And in a human rights context, I would have to ask, what, where are we? What have we learned? And I would say, tragically, not, not much. 10 years, 10 years, this was under President Eisenhower. And this has been a bipartisan failure, not just a Democrat or Republican failure. Maybe you've heard of this. And of course, there's a book. <laughs> called Operation Wetback, the forced removal of thousands of Mexicans in the 1950s from this part of the country back across the Rio Grande, using that official language. That was the name of the government program to, again, assault an entire group of people, label them as something or somehow less than meriting the full rights that all people are entitled to. And just in my lifetime, I was born in 1950, so in my awakening, what have I seen? What have you seen? The onslaught against Southeast Asians who came to this country following the Vietnam conflict. Both people who were attacked and demeaned because of who they were and where they came from. And since the 80s, the ongoing assault under different administrations against people from the Middle East or Islamic world frequently because of either the country they're from or the faith they embrace. We still have this idea in the law. It shouldn't be, but there seems to be in the mindset of many people in this country. And tragically, some of them are 
lawmakers, some at the high levels of power, who can still look at a group of people and see them as less than deserving of their full fundamental inherent rights the way they think they should be entitled to. There's still an us and them mentality. And, and I would say in large part because we don't teach human rights. Human rights education is not the answer, but it's a large part of the answer, especially for our younger people who are sooner or later, you and me, we're gonna get out of their way and it'll be their turn to run this country and this world. And hopefully they will have a better understanding of what happened to Japanese Americans and what has continued to happen to other groups in the name of the law. And that's the key phrase here. This wasn't done extra legally outside the law. This was done with a, the stroke of a president's pen it was legal, and we have got to get to a point where that mentality really is seen to be something in the past and put in the dustbin of history instead of seeing the links between what happened to Dr. Kuramatsu's dad and many like him to people today who are still walking this country and demanding dignity and rights. We have a lot of work to do. Okay. Um, I, have one, I have a question for you. I'm going to ask you to keep your answer brief because I want to hit at least one more question before we close. Um, so, Karen, when you found out about your father's story, did he share more details or did he continue to stay quiet about it? Oh, no, my father uh, just stayed quiet uh, and, until his uh, until the evidence was, was found to reopen up his case. Um, and then actually, uh, he, you know, I learned um, after after his case was um, overturned in 1983. Um, it was his legal team that encouraged him to to speak out and and, and to share his story. Uh, and it was actually being with him and hearing his story. That's how I learned more about my father's experiences and how he felt. Uh, so it it's, it was an interesting, you know, process. Uh, and if you told me, you know, even 11 years ago that I'd be here talking to you, I would have said, not me. But he gave me the charge five months before he passed away to carry on with education and telling his story because he didn't want something like the Japanese American incarceration to happen again. But I, I know that for, for many families, it's been, you know, it's difficult for them to share their experiences. We were talking about this earlier at dinner that, you know, it's kind of the, 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 uh, the great generation um, my father's generation, they're the ones that, you know, the 442nd or my father or many people in the military or their experiences that it, they weren't always able to share their story. It was so painful, their experiences, and it's taken the next generation to kind of bring it out, um, out of them. And so ask, ask they're not going to sit down and start telling you from day one. Uh -uh. That doesn't, you have to ask the questions. And I tell students, well, if, if you, if you know, just say, you know, Grandpa, I've, I've got an assignment for my class. I need to ask you some questions. Anything to get them to start talking. But but you ask the questions. They won't start just volunteering the information. I have one last question. I think it's a perfect way to close this evening. And David, I'm going to direct it towards you. Um, looking to today, 2020 and 2021 have been very difficult years for the Asian American community. You know, it's been 80 years since Executive Order 9066, and yet we continue to see anti-Asian hate and prejudice with multiple tragic incidents. Um, given this increase in anti-Asian hate, what are ways that we can support the AAPI community? Well, number one, and, and you talk about it, it's the first thing that we see when you walk into the museum, and that is speak up and defend. Um, and that's a very difficult thing to do. And we often see in the news, Casts and stuff like that. You see the cell phone video of somebody being accosted on the subway, and maybe it's a little old lady. And yet, there's people sitting around watching it happen, but nobody's defending her. You know, we have turned into a country of cowards. I'm sorry to say it, but we are. And so, we see these assaults and these, uh, this offensive behavior everywhere we go. And yet, there are so few people speaking up on, on, the, on the victim's behalf and helping that person. And I know. It's difficult. It, it takes a lot of courage and sometimes it puts you in danger. But you have to think, you know, we've always prided ourselves as being a country that rises up to the occasion. 
or the courageous yeah. ones, or the ones who, like you said, we stick our chest out, you know? Uh, but I don't see that happening when it comes to what we've seen in the last two years. We also have to really be honest about sources of hate. And the people who put this label uh, on Asians, and it all began with Kung Flu and the Chinese virus. And you have a whole political party that says it's fine. It's fine to put a face on an epidemic. And that's how this all thing began, was we put a face on an epidemic, on a disease, on a virus. And the next thing we know is a, forgive the term, but a tsunami of assaults on Asians. It's not a coincidence. And yet we have so many cowardly people in positions of leadership who see the truth and do not speak up about it. And again, that's what I mean. We are no longer a courageous country. So I think each and every one of us have to kind of look at ourselves and say, would I have the, uh, the ability to defend somebody who needs to defend? Them? You know, that, that first quote, and I wish I almost want to pull my, my phone out because I took a photo of it because I think it's so appropriate. And, it, and it's the first thing you see when you go into the, the museum here and it's, it's uh, excuse me, hang on. I'm, I'm horrible with one, one, one hand here. But two seconds, I'm almost there. I'm almost there. <laughs> we took a lot of pictures. <laughs> it's, you know, the upstander quote. It's the first thing you see when you walk in the museum. Stands up for other people and their rights. Combats injustice, inequality, or unfairness. Sees something wrong and works to make it right. I mean, I know there are factions of people who are doing that. But there's not enough of them. And the fact that we're talking about Asian hate now, and, and you heard Dr. Ray give the whole history of Asian hate going back two centuries. And can you say it's a whole lot different today? People are vilified because they're Asian, they're vilified because of the way they look, and there's so many people in this country, that's cool. That's fine. So we need to finally put our foot down and, and defend those people, and not just those people, but all people. You know, this all is about characterizations. And if you look at the history of our country, politicians rise up and say, I will defend you from that person because that person is different. We saw it in Chinese exclusion. We saw it against Muslims. We saw it against immigrants. We saw it against Native Americans. Savages. We call them savages under the U.S. Constitution. We vilified them and demeaned them on the U.S. Constitution from the very beginning of this country. So it's been something that we have dealt with our entire time. And yet we want to revere our country and say we are wonderful, which we are. There's a lot of things about us that are, but we don't know enough about the parts that we, we didn't get right. And that kind of brings us back to education. So and part of doing education right is to do it courageously and speak the truth. And, and we just need more people who are willing to do that and defend the truth as well. Thank you so much. There are so many questions I could ask, but we are well over time. So please now join me in a round of applause. <laughs> my father's words uh, if you don't remember anything else he said stand up for what is right when you see something wrong don't be afraid to speak up this is a central simple truth of human rights there is no such thing as a lesser person should be. <laughs> and just improvise. Good evening, everyone. My name is Bora Lachi, and I'm with the Tower Center. I first want to say thank you so much for everyone being here. At the Tower Center, we promote the study of public policy and international affairs. First, I just want to say, wow, this has been a very meaningful and educational program as daughter of immigrants. This is really touching. So let's give another round of applause to our speakers. <laughs> 
And a special thank you to our co-partners, AJC Dallas, Japan American Society Dallas-Fort Worth, and Dallas Holocaust and Human Rights Museum for hosting us. Without these amazing community partners, this event would not be possible. I would also like to thank Paul, Joel, Amy, and Annie and Caroline for making this event a success. So thank you all so much for being here and we all hope that we'll see you again for future programs. Thank you, have a great evening.